perfection is the enemy of, of progress. So you, you have to let go sometimes of, of making it perfect and just move forward. Welcome to Honest E-Commerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. I'm your host, Chase Clymer. And today, we are welcoming to the show the CEO and founder of Final. It's a company that created the Final Straw, the world's first reusable, collapsible straw. Emma and her team are on a mission to help people rid their lives of single-use plastic. Emma Rose Cohen, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm amazing. Thanks for having me, Chase. Awesome. So this is this is a super fun journey. Uh, and, I, and I can't wait to kind of dive right in. Uh, so one thing I noticed in kind of reading your onboarding stuff here is you uh, kind of started uh, this journey more in uh, kind of the educational space, if I could say, like you've got your master's and you've done a lot of work in environmental sciences, which bonus fact, my business partner has a degree in environmental sciences and now we're in e-commerce. But uh, so I guess just take us back there to where the seed was planted that you kind of wanted to start a business to kind of do good. Yeah, I I never really had like a plan as to what I was doing. It's always been just kind of follow my passion, follow what excites me and and take it from there. So I in college, I was studying neuroscience because I'm like obsessed with the brain and drugs and how, you know, our perceptions of reality. And, and I was kind of particularly fascinated by the fact that we were like, over medicating kids with like Adderall. Anyways, total sidebar. That was where I thought I was going. And so I I got my EMT. I started working in a hospital and I was like, what on earth? I hate hospitals. Like they're the worst. Like you walk into one and it's just like everything in my body just says no. Um, and so that was kind of like, okay, I'm not doing that. And so at the same time, my girlfriends and I just happened to have a bunch of mermaid outfits and we're like, let's dress up like mermaids and like do a beach cleanup. So we did. And it was super fun. And we realized that like sustainability kind of had this like really terrible branding on it. It was very granola, very hippie, very like extremist. And really like, you know, we're all living on the same planet together. We all have this only one earth that we have to share. So like, is 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 being an environmentalist you know as niche as it is perceived and in my opinion it's not it's something that really any practical person cares about so anyways you know by dressing up like mermaids and being sparkly and fun a lot of people wanted to join us so it was like oh okay so if we put this different spin on sustainability um more people are interested in participating and it's it's more of a kind of open source where everyone can participate and and um, add their contribution so fast forward a bit i realized that this was my path and this is what i really cared about and did my master's in environmental management and sustainability ended up getting a, jo a job at los alamos national laboratory in waste minimization worked there for four years but it turns out government work is not meant for a mermaid so <laughs> I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go be a ski bum up in Whistler and like I'd saved enough money to like eat ramen for a year. And I was really excited to just kind of like tune out, be in the mountains and just shred all the time. And um, that didn't last too long because I started working on vinyl as just kind of a side project. I was like, this is a cool idea. Like maybe it'll be something. And then launched the Kickstarter in April of 2018 and raised two million dollars in a month and it was like you know completely unexpected and and changed the trajectory of my life forever all right all right we can add like belittle the starting and foundation of your business down to two or three sentences i'm gonna have to dive in a bit there so you you're in whistler and you're working on what became the final straw what was that like what were you actually doing yeah so you know it started with this idea that well first of all you know, no, like creating a successful business depends on one thing, which is timing. And, and so the timing was such that the Seattle was banning single use plastic straws 
And, you know, I thought this was pretty revolutionary since, you know, up until that point, the only plastic items that had been banned were single use bags. And those bans were really controversial because, you know, a lot of people use their, their plastic bags more than once. So the controversy was like, well, how do I, I then have to buy my bathroom ba uh, trash bags now. And people were just all up in arms. But straws, on the other hand, um, didn't have as much controversy around them besides for, you know, ensuring that people who need straws still have access to them. But beyond that, it's like, you know, for them, for, you know, 99% of people, a straw is not 100% necessary. It's, it's more of a luxury. So anyways, if you went on Amazon or Google or anywhere in early 2018 and Googled reusable straw, all you would find was a bamboo straw, a glass straw or a metal straw. And these are just, you know, these long things that stick out of your bag and there's no way to carry them around. You're poking yourself in the pocket. Like it is just not convenient. I like multiple times would have glass straws break in my purse and they would just have shards everywhere. And mind you, I don't even use straws, but people would just buy me straws because I was like obsessed with plastic straws and, and eliminating them. And so people are like, here you go, like, shut up. Um, <laughs> um, so anyways, um, so there was this huge gap in the market. There was about to be this legislative, massive legislative change. And, and there was nothing really filling this, this area of like straws on the go, which is where most people use straws. So um, yeah, kind of, you know, I knew all of that was going on, but that wasn't really the driving factor. The driving factor was to create something innovative and different and exciting and new that gave people a tool to reduce their waste. Because up until that point, it was like, you know, if you wanted to kind of have a marker of, of being aligned with the environmental movement, it was like you carry a water bottle and that was kind of the thing or reusable bags. But I want to expand that way beyond those two items and make these, you know, super convenient, easy to use, fun and exciting products that make it super easy to say no to single use plastic and also are design forward and cute. Absolutely. And for, for those that are uninitiated to what the final straw looks like, can you talk about kind of the difference between what you brought to market versus kind of what was out there, these, you know, metal, glass or bamboo straws? Sure. So the final straw uh, comes in a little case and it basically is, is inspired by a tent pole. So it's, it's made with four metal segments with silicone running through them. When you pull it out of the case, it self assembles and it's essentially a tent pole you can suck out of. So it has silicone running all down the middle and these four metal segments that you can break apart just like a tent pole or an avalanche probe, whatever. Um, and it goes right back in this recycled plastic case. Uh, it also comes with a telescoping cleaner so that you can clean it on the go because that's everyone's first question is how do I clean it? And yeah, uh, just throw it on your keychain. And for those straw enthusiasts out there, it's it's the Cadillac of straws. There, there is no better. Yeah, it's it's a it's an awesome little device, uh, and I, I'm gonna get my hands on one soon. So uh, I guess where did the idea come from? You know, was it was it when you were up in Whistler seeing these avalanche probes? I feel like that would be kind of in the in the environment, or you know, how did how how did you go through iterations? You know, the the iterations were really in material sourcing it was it was just a very simple concept put four segments with a tube around it into a case um and the iterations really came when we went for design for manufacturing so once we raised all the money for the kickstarter then it was like oh shit now i have to make you know two hundred thousand straws i have zero uh design experience zero manufacturing experience like i'm i i no clue so hired a design firm and from there, we started iterating on, you know, how can we integrate the cleaning device? How can we make this kind of as small and compact as possible, um, but still incredibly functional and high quality? Um, so there was, uh, for, for any of those old school fans out there, there was a Final Straw 1.0. Um, it had a drying rack in it, and it had a squeegee instead of the telescoping brush. I really didn't like this design, um, but we were incredibly pressed on time and, and had to deliver because we told our Kickstarter people that we were delivering for Christmas and like, you know, the holidays and it was this big pressure and, you know, 100,000 people uh, sending emails like, where's my straw? So anyways, um, that model 
um, you know, still is amazing and great and cool, but, but I like this one better because it is smaller, more compact, uses less materials, which is obviously more sustainable. And, um, you know, we, we iterated on the manufacturing process to be able to use a lighter weight metal. And so that's less materials, um, and, and lighter weight. So yeah, this is a lot of iteration and, and constantly, you know, looking at things and trying to, um, make it perfect, but but any inventor or designer out there knows that like perfection is the enemy of of progress. So you you have to let go sometimes of of making it perfect and just move forward. Absolutely, I, I feel, and that that goes uh, that goes kind of hand in hand with like just a website. Like a website's never optimized. The website's oh, yeah. never done. It, it, you know, it, something can always be better, um, but. We we skipped ahead on a certain bit that I know that I'm gonna get yelled at if I don't uh, talk about it. It's like, how did you you know how did you have such a successful Kickstarter? What did that look like? Yeah, so the Kickstarter, you know, and yes, I know I kind of like made it like, oh, we just launched our Kickstarter. <laughs> I put three months of full time work into the Kickstarter. Um, there were two articles uh, that Tim Ferriss put on his blog about creating an email list and running a successful Kickstarter campaign. And I basically followed those to a T. So what that meant first is generating interested leads. So first off, I started by building a social media following. I'm obsessed with memes and pop culture. I think it's just the coolest way to transmit information and, and obviously something that's really caught on with our generation. And so I started making a meme account on Final Straw and, and you know, specifically around single use plastic. And it, it caught on really quickly. Um, I got 10,000 followers in, you know, like three months. And so from there we had a fan base. So then I was able to start promoting a landing page, which was just a super simple landing page with a photo of the final straw case on it that said next to it, there's a straw in here. So we're creating mystery. We're, you know, generating, um, uh, you know, interest and, and a little bit of like mystique. And so it said, sign up to be the first to know. When you signed up on that landing page, it then gave you the option to refer friends and get discounts. So that is through a program called Viral Loops. And, and so basically we were able to amass about 4,000 email addresses before launching. And then the second that the Kickstarter went live, we emailed all these people, hey, it's live, share it with your friends. And, and that was kind of the beginning of the virality of the campaign. If you're struggling with scaling your sales, maybe Electric Eye can help. Our team has helped our clients generate millions of dollars in additional revenue through our unique brand scaling framework. You can learn more about our agency at electriceye.io. That's E L E C T R I C E Y E.io. Businesses are the most successful when they own their own data, customer relationships, and their growth. That's why more than 50,000 e-commerce brands, big and small, trust Klaviyo to deliver their ideal customer experience. Klaviyo is the ultimate e-commerce marketing platform for online brands of all kinds and all sizes. With email automation, SMS marketing, list growth tools, and more, you'll get everything you need to build strong relationships that keep your customers coming back. If you're tired of relying too heavily on paid advertising or third-party marketplaces for your sales success, you're not alone. It's time to take back control of the customer experience. More and more online businesses are moving to Klaviyo to grow higher value customer relationships through personalized email and SMS marketing. And the results are staggering. Ready to drive future sales and higher customer lifetime value with a marketing platform built for your long-term growth? You should get a free trial of Clavio over at clavio.com slash honest. That's K L A V I Y O dot com slash H O N E S T. Hey, everybody. Do you want to win back valuable lost time for your support team? Gorgeous has machine learning functionality that takes the pressure off small support teams and gives them the tools to manage a large number of inquiries at scale, especially during the holiday season. Gorgeous combines all your different communication channels like email, SMS, social media, live chat, and even phone into one platform and gives you an organized view of all of your customer inquiries. Their powerful functionality can save your support team hours per day and makes managing customer orders a breeze. 
They have allowed online merchants to close tickets faster than ever with the help of pre-written responses integrated with customer data to increase the overall efficiency of customer support. Their built-in automations also free up time for support agents to give better answers to complex product-related questions, providing next-level support, which helps increase sales, brand loyalty, and recognition. Eric Brandholtz, the founder of Beard Brand, says, We're a seven-figure business, and we have essentially one person on customer support and experience. It's impossible to do it without tools like Gorgeous to help us innovate. Learn how to level up your customer support by speaking to their team here. Visit gorgeous.grsm.io slash honest. That's G-O-R-G-I-A-S dot G-R-S-M dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Since 2004, Avalara's vision has been to harness the power of cloud technology to help simplify sales tax for businesses of all sizes. Avalara's solutions are designed to affordably scale with businesses as they grow over time. Tax compliance is not a revenue generating activity, so Avalara's technology is designed to help you manage tax compliance as efficiently and accurately as possible, so you can reclaim your valuable time and reduce risk in your business. With more than 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point-of-sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash honest. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Avalara, tax compliance done right. Our partner Rewind can protect your Shopify store with automated backups of your most important data. Rewind should be the first app you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, or collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. Trusted by over 80,000 businesses, from side hustles to the biggest online retailers like Gymshark, Gatorade, and Movement Watches. Best of all, merchants like you can get one month of automated Shopify backups for free by visiting rewind.io slash honest. That's R-E-W-I-N-D dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Another big thing that I did to make the Kickstarter go big is that for months, I set up Google News Alerts for plastic straws, plastic pollution, all of these things. And, and this was dominating headlines at the time. And so I was emailing every single one of these reporters, which ended up being around 700 reporters um, in those three months. Hey, I saw your article about plastic straws. Guess what? I've figured out the solution. It's going to be amazing. I got zero responses for 700 emails. And this is like, you know, hundreds of hours of work. Two weeks before the campaign, BuzzFeed responds. And I'm like, oh, wow, I cannot let this slip through my fingers. So I ended up, um, you know, getting in contact with them, bringing them some straws. They loved the project, did a video on it that launched the day the Kickstarter went live. So it was kind of just this confluence of all of these, you know, all of this hard work and everything kind of just aligned perfectly. And, and you know, as I said earlier, timing is is the most crucial aspect of it all. Yeah. And I just want to kind of talk about the, the cold email thing right there. 700 with no replies. And it just takes one to kind of change the course of the business. And it's those non-scalable things at the onset of a business, which are really going to make or break things. And uh, you'll find parallels in a lot of stories that they a lot of just non-scalable, just doing the work to kind of get things to the next level is, is what it kind of happens all the time. The Kickstarter is now launched. You've got all these email addresses. You're starting to get some momentum on Kickstarter. Obviously, it's a great viral success with the support of uh, uh, the BuzzFeed kind of feature. You know, now the thing's all said and done. Uh, you talked about hiring uh, a design firm. I'm assuming that was a product design firm. Yes. Awesome. So you get them involved. You know, what does what's the next step after a Kickstarter? I feel like some people um, don't realize how to turn it into like a sustainable business, kind of take it away from like the crowdfunding esque thing into its own actual direct consumer business. So kind of walk us through the the growth of the it going from like here's a one time product purchase to here is a business. Yeah. So, you know, as the Kickstarter was just exploding, it was um, the first thing is hiring. So you have to hire people to start responding to all the messages. We were getting thousands of messages a day and, and press inquiries and, you know, everyone's reaching out because um, they, they're interested, including Shark Tank, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little later. 
But um, yeah, so hiring a team is kind of the next thing and it's the hardest thing. Um, you know, I, I have so much respect for people who have built uh, incredible companies because they're not the ones building it. It's the team that's building it. And it's all they're doing is, is you know, picking the right people. And it's so, so hard. Um, you know, a lot of people say they can do things that they just absolutely cannot. So, um, you know, I, I'd say that that's the next big thing. And then building the website and then, you know, for me, I, I mentioned earlier, like I, I don't use straws. Um, I just want to provide solutions for for things that that people encounter on a daily basis. So at my mind, as soon as this did well, was like immediately like what's next and what else can we create that is going to solve more problems for me and other people? Because, you know, straw users are a fraction of the population. But, you know, we recently came out with our fork and spork, which I'm, you know, so proud of and so obsessed with because this is something that I use on a regular basis. So it's the same concept as final straw, but it's a foldable spork. And I use this all the time. With kind of getting getting the first initial run of products out, how long was it until uh, you were, you know, about to launch the second product? Like what was like the timing between the launch of the final straw and the, kind of the next iteration of products? Yeah. So, um, you know, we didn't launch the Spork until August or September of 2020. Um, you know, when you, most people have a few years to build up the kind of revenue that we had on the first year. And so it was playing catch up for two years straight of just trying to build a team, get solid processes, build SOPs. Um, you know, I, I had a co-founder at the beginning, we had a big falling out. So, you know, dealing with that legal disaster, um, you know, that there's a lot behind it. And it's funny to think that, you know, we survived for two, well, we thrived for two years on one straw and sold, you know, hundreds and thousands of them. And, and then, you know, things have shifted quite a bit, obviously with, with the pandemic hitting and this being a travel based business, but you know, as an entrepreneur, you just have to pivot. Absolutely. So now that you guys have pivoted a bit, uh, you got some new product offerings. Um, how, how did like the launch strategy change or the market marketing strategy evolve? Uh, are you still taking products to market through crowdsourcing type adventures or, you know, is it, is there a different strategy these days? Yeah, it really depends on the product. Um, I, our most recent crowdfunding campaign was called Final Wipe. And that was a real knee jerk reaction to the pandemic hitting. Um, you know, I learned a lot in that. This is my first company. And so made a lot of mistakes, but that's okay. Um, it's part of the game. So, you know, I think if I were to go back in time, I would have done it quite differently, but you know, I was, everyone was really freaking out back in March and it was like, what is going on? We need to do something. We need to be involved. We need to solve problems. And, you know, I was using a ton of single use wipes and I was like, this, this is a way that as you know, our company can help people who are dealing with these same problems. And so that's why we launched a reusable cleaning wipe. Um, but I don't know, I, you know, I think for future products, it's just, it's going to be a case by case situation. Do I think crowdfunding is the best way to launch this? Or do we want to launch it internally, you know, to our existing customer base? Absolutely. It, it definitely makes sense to kind of weigh the options there. And especially because you've got such loyal fans, you know, you can probably test the waters before a, a bigger launch to see, you know, the reactions. And also the way that your customers talk about the product is like having them write copy for you. It's pretty, pretty awesome. They just use their exact words out there in your marketing. So let's, let's kind of pivot here. You're getting a bunch of inquiries from people about the launch of the final straw. And obviously everyone's favorite Shark Tank reached out. Uh, what can you share about that experience? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, I can share most of it. So two weeks into the Kickstarter, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just beyond any sort of like, like, I, I, I don't think I was like feeling feelings then. It was just like full robot, like have to just respond to emails. Like I was sleeping in bed with my computer, waking up, typing emails, working, you know, 18 hour days. It was insanity. So Shark Tank reaches out and they're like, 
um, you know, we're interested in having you guys on the show. And can you send over, you know, your P&Ls and balance sheets? And I'm like Googling, like, what's a P&L? So, you know, that's the level that I was at when I started this business. Um, but, you know, it was like, okay, when Shark Tank reaches out, like you just, you go for it, you dive in. And so I put together all of the financials and everything. And mind you, this is, you know, a three week old company at this point. So we're putting together projections based on like, you know, three weeks of sales, which is just silly. But anyways, um, went on Shark Tank uh, about six weeks after we launched, um, filmed the episode and yeah, you know, like I'd never pitched to investors in my life. And so my first pitch was to Mark Cuban. And I think that, you know, I valued the business at what I knew it would be at the end of like, at the end of the year. But, you know, what they were seeing was, you know, some very ambitious entrepreneurs who had really good sales for six weeks, but had no proven track record of creating a product. And so I see it really well from both sides, like why we got the offers we did. And I got offers from both Mark and Kevin. Um, and I turned them down because I didn't think that they were valuing us as as high as we should be valued. So. Yeah, I, I I don't regret that decision. Well, actually, if I were to go back in time, I probably would have just done the deal on TV because everyone wants to just see a deal and then it would probably fall apart in the terms, um, which, you know, maybe I'd get in trouble for. But like the, the people just want to see a deal. Yeah, everyone wants wants it to happen. because You're rooting for them because, it, you know, you feel like it's going it, to they're going to win uh, when, when something like that happens. Did you now... Uh, when the episode aired, did uh, did you see like uh, what I've heard is like there's like a Shark Tank bump in sales? Oh yeah, and to this day it still re-airs and we see bumps. Um, you know, it wasn't like you know I, I've read about products like you know the the whatever sponge and like some cutting board and it's like they sell they sell out they crash their website overnight. Um, you know, the Shark Tank audience isn't super environmentally inclined in general. Um, there are absolutely a lot of watch uh, viewers out there that are, but I would say, um, you know, we're selling a product that you usually get for free. So you don't generally have to pay for plastic cutlery or straws or whatever. And what we're saying is here, spend $20, $30 on this product. It's an investment in the future. It's investment in reducing plastics. It is a way to show your community that you care about the environment. And so, you know, it, it is a tougher sell for people who are like, wait, you're trying to sell me something that I would get for free. Yeah, it definitely would make uh, prospecting in your marketing a lot more difficult because uh, there is definitely a type of consumer where these issues resonate with them. And then there's another type of the market that just frankly don't care. Yeah. So, you know, that's a challenge for the marketing team. Um, I do want to ask uh, here, though, uh, you have uh, now been uh, you, you joined 1% for the planet. Let's talk about that a little bit and how you decided to become a member. You know, that's always been a, a motivating factor for me. The whole reason I created this company isn't to make a bunch of money. It's to make a change in the world, to make a lasting impact. And I think 1% for the planet should be uh, obligatory for every company. Um, you know, anyone that is extracting a resource using materials, whether that be energy um, or, you know, physical uh, product materials, whatever it might be, um, should be giving back because we are taking without um, giving back to the world. So 1% for the planet basically means that you donate 1% of your gross revenue to environmental nonprofits. And it really is like a symbiotic relationship. The, the nonprofits that we work with promote us and, and, you know, they're trying to obviously boost our sales because then it comes back to them. So it's, it's really cool to have these kind of relationships and be able to support the companies that are doing, you know, have been doing this work for so long. You know, we're really new and, and young and, and a lot of these nonprofits have been around for, you know, decade or more and, and really know the ins and outs of the systems and, and have incredible connections. And, you know, I highly recommend it to anyone out there who's, who's kind of on the fence. Absolutely. Now, Emma, is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you think would resonate with the audience? 
Um, maybe just a little bit about what's next. Well, where are you going? What's going on? Yeah, so I'm really excited to kind of p continue pivoting. Um, corona and, and the global pandemic has, has made me realize where a lot of the issues are in packaging and single use plastic production. So I don't want to give up too much, but we are moving into the bathroom and we'll be working on some really cool products to make it much easier to live sustainably. And that ultimately is the challenge. I'm not going after, you know, I don't want my customers to, to just be, you know, the tree hugging hippies, which who I love because I'm one of them. But I also want this to be for the, the, you know, average person that is busy, needs convenience and wants beautiful design and they care, but they're not necessarily going to go way above and beyond to seek it out. So similar to the way that Method Soap created their product and brand um, with, you know, beautiful design, amazing sense and sustainability on the back end. That's really what I'm trying to do. How can we make something that people just love? and is also sustainable. Awesome. And I look forward to kind of watching that journey from afar and checking in with you in a couple months and maybe having you back on the show and we can deep dive into something. Emma, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, everyone go check out final.co, check out the amazing Final Straw and all of the other fun products that they have there. Yes. Thanks so much for having me, Chase. Always fun. All right. I can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own business. You can find all the links in the show notes. Make sure you head over to honestecommerce.co to check out all of the other amazing content that we have. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review. And obviously, if you're thinking about growing your business, check out our agency at electriceye.io. Until next time.